Please join me in welcoming Dr. Julia Clark. Thank you, Jennifer. It's my great pleasure to be here today with all of you. And I'll go ahead and load up my slide deck and we'll enter a different world. So I wanted to start this talk today just by introducing a little bit of what I do and kind of what paleontology or the kind of research behind the science you're going to hear about looks like. So I'm a field paleontologist. I use the methods, um, a lot of them uh, based in geoscience to find new fossils, but that's only the start of the journey. So, so often we think of the moment of discovery as occurring out in the field, but so much of my most exciting discoveries have been you you know making sense of incredible fossils um things that have been uh preserved for over the last mostly 160 million years in my case and from these these fossils being prompted to ask new questions of extant or living animals and so it is really my the discoveries that I've found most exciting are kind of in this messy disciplinary boundaries um, where it's fossils and working with things from the deep past that have led to new discoveries about the biology and uh, secret lives of living animals. So it's also important to emphasize, I think, in every kind of science research talk that nothing of what we present is the, ever the work of a single individual. And so much of my work has been enriched by all of the conversations I've had with diverse collaborators and students, and these are some of some of those, but really a lot of the ones that are, are, are involved in the work I'm going to present today are not even featured in this. This is my more recent lab groups, but they it really is in this place where we talk about science and we try to make sense of things as a group that we really move forward. So let's get into the secret lives of dinosaurs. Um, I've had this title for a while and I like it because what uh, most dinosaurs um, have lived in our imagination. That's where they've really come to life. Ever since the first dinosaurs were discovered, this is one of the very early illustrations of dinosaurs, we have been compelled to bring them to life. Imagine their appearance, how they might interact with us. Um, imagine how they might interact with our technologies and even perhaps their secret artistic sense. So we've been interested in bringing them to life by imagining their behaviors and thinking about what they might look like. And so much of what we imagine of this, of, of what are really extinct animals, uh, in the case of, of something that's shown here in this illustration, are uh, brought to life in our imagination. So what I want to do in this talk is really talk about the science behind uh, what we know about key aspects of dinosaur appearances and behavior. And I'm going to focus on several of those today. And it's really been a fun journey, so I'll show you some of the behind the scenes of the science. But let's go back to basics. How do we use science to reveal the secret lives of dinosaurs? Well, over hundreds of years, scientists have been looking at the most readily fossilizable parts of dinosaurs, that is bony tubercles, um, measuring portions of bones to look at making sense of the evolutionary relationships and function of extinct dinosaurs. And so often these, this evidence has accrued to give us both insights into these evolutionary relationships, but also into these behaviors. In my research, a key toolkit is not just these, this fossil evidence, but it's taking apart living animals. So I like to illustrate that here with um, another Julia showing you um, uh, how one might approach a, a, a living dinosaur to make sense of its anatomy. So let's approach this question of appearances. And I'm just going to briefly touch on that because in more recent years, my research has moved to other areas. But this is a key part of how we bring dinosaurs to life. So in our imagination, dinosaurs often look like this. Even in the most recent Jurassic World films, you see these kind of spiny uh, series down the back and scaly and predominantly uh, four-legged. And I think these illustrations, and even those of, of Ray Harryhausen, kind of 
re a reminiscent of this little guy. Now this is the Tuatara, which is in fact most closely related to living lizards and snakes. But if we want to look for where dinosaurs are placed based on all of this bony evidence to begin with, um, they're placed in a very different part of the tree of life. And in fact, we've located them with um, crocodilians as their closest living cousins and birds as, in fact, living dinosaurs. Now I'm going to focus on evidence from other systems today uh, that have helped us to make sense of even more compelling questions. But if we just focus on appearances, these two relative, like living dinosaurs and crocodilians, they look very different. So how might we approach this? We had an amazing series of breakthroughs starting in 1996, um, right around the time I started graduate school that were made in northeastern China. And these were discoveries coming out of uh, rapidly deepening lake basins in northeast China. And what we have is rapid burial. So we got preservation of structures that are rarely preserved in the fossil record. And those included things like the first discovered feathered dinosaur shown here, which are uh, with tiny filaments along the back of its body. And this was just really transformative. This dinosaur, to give you a sense, is about the size of a chicken. Um, so it's very small and it's covered in this filamentous covering uh, and really prompted a new thinking about the origin of feathers. But more broadly, we found many more dinosaurs uh, that extinct dinosaurs that had bristles, that had thin filaments, a whole range of structures. And in dinosaurs that based on bony evidence we placed as more closely related to living birds, we also had true branched feathers. And they were actually in some surprising places, including long branched feathers on the legs. But in these dinosaurs that were uh, more closely related based on the bony evidence to living birds, they also showed uh, a diverse set of, of branched or what we call pinnate feathers. And that is only our, our whole menagerie of these extinct dinosaurs with a diverse body coverings is only expanding as we move forward. More recently, we've actually been able to look at tiny, um, look within the preserved fossil feathers. This is an illustration of the dinosaur I just showed, um, a reconstruction based on multiple fossils. But then it's within those fossilized feathers, uh, we could look at the structure of melanin pigment containing organelles. And in this case, I'm showing you what was one of my most exciting discoveries, or, or rather one that was made um, with collaborators, uh, that you have these uniquely elongate pigment packages that are associated with the creation of iridescent colors in birds such as pheasants and ducks, for example. And this whole dinosaur was covered in these very elongate, skinny melanin packages. And you might be asking yourself, why would there be a relationship between these preserved melanin containing packages or their impressions and color? And it turns out that the chemistry of the component melanin shows a relationship with the colors produced um, in living birds. And so you can test that by looking at a variety of different species. And there's living species of birds shown in contrast uh, there up above other extant species. So what you can do is then start making sense of um, other aspects of dinosaur appearances that are um, give us more insights into their behavior, as I'll talk about in a moment. Because we didn't just find this form of iridescence, this low-grade uh, iridescence, at least, made by these long, skinny pigment packages, but we also found in a different dinosaur um, from older deposits, in fact, evidence of um, these pigment-containing structures that are um, kind of wide and rather a, a little more pancake-like. And it turns out that this shape, um, pigment packages, is uniquely associated with um, arrays that generate iridescent color or a, a low-grade glossy color in other groups of birds. 
And in fact, they're most similar. So if you look at the um, pink, which is the dinosaur in this particular study, Kai Hong Juji, the rainbow dinosaur, you can see that it's overlapping a space um, occupied primarily by hummingbirds. And this, these um, plate or, or pancake-like melanosomes weren't all over the body. These, these pigment packages are called melanosomes, but they are were differentially located in the head and the neck region. And over the rest of the body, we had evidence of short, um, narrow melanosomes associated with black color. But this really shed new light on, now we had two extinct dinosaurs that showed different ways of making uh, iridescent color. And this kind of broadly is writ large, it, can, it changes the way we see these animals. So this is a reconstruction of the first dinosaur I showed, um, Microraptor, and it, it gives a very different sense, not just of, of a kind of movie, what you could bring to movies if you cared about bringing that science to, um, to our reconstructions, but also it gives insight into how these feathers were used in dinosaurs, extinct dinosaurs, because we can look to living dinosaurs and we can see that iridescence is most commonly used in signaling to other parts of the same species that it's used in visual communication, signaling, and, in, and deeply involved in sexual selection in living dinosaurs. So by, by asking questions about the appearance of extinct dinosaurs, we could make these connections, um, discover that they are potentially deployed in similar ways in extinct dinosaurs. So that's a really interesting part of the evolution of, of feathers that's so early in their evolution they're deployed in signaling and communication but that's really a starting point for what we're going to uh, talk about today some people are um, a, a lot of the early literature on the structures this is a very complex slide i'll walk you through it uh, were focused on these filamentous structures being called feather precursors or proto feathers. But one thing that I'd like to illuminate is that by thinking about dinosaur body coverings, we actually get a two key transitions that have occurred in uh, within the group. And one is very, very deep and early in dinosaur evolution where uh, we think these filaments first arise. And that's when we see this, this shift in a group that also includes pterosaurs towards um, more lightly built bodies, higher metabolic rates, and shifts in, in breathing. But it's 100 million years later that we see the evolution of flight. So, and in the earliest known pinnate feathers are still coming in around 160. That is almost a million years after the origin of these filaments. So I think we need to view this as like there's a diverse dinosaur body coverings. They're deployed in multiple purposes um, early in their evolution. They're deployed in signaling before they are uh, deployed in locomotion or those two attention between using feathers in signaling and using feathers in form of locomotion or movement are occurring around the same time. So this has revolutionized our understanding by thinking about dinosaur exteriors we've really gained insight into um, potential evolutionary drivers that uh, are key behind uh, in the in evolution of the whole group so many people found this kind of new vision of dinosaurs disappointing um, in fact that we would have a, a very different viewpoint do we have to give up um, you know, I think many of you would be aware that in the most recent Jurassic World films, they did not choose to have filamentous or feather covered dinosaurs and explain it away. But what an exciting challenge because so much of the body coverings of these animals are related to what they do and how they communicate and how they behave. I think this new vision of dinosaurs, this is a large bodied tyrannosaurid that was discovered with filaments is beautiful and it really prompts us to think how think more about communication and to think more about aspects of these animals that we had not and i had not previously explored so actually it was thinking about dinosaur communication that led me 
and thinking about sexual selection, which is um, selection on sig for ornaments or for things that function in attracting a mate but don't necessarily make you a better fit for your environment. Um, that led me to what has now been my research area for about seven years, which is around um, the evolution of, of, of sound making in dinosaurs. So let's look at what the imagination has said about what dinosaurs sound like. And I think this clip will be familiar to many of you. So here we go. Here's just a one clip. Let's look at it. Oh. <laughs> Okay, so just remember two things about that, what it sounded like, and I ask every audience this, and everyone always says lion, and then I have a picture of a lion, but you saw it ahead of time, so the surprise is lost. But think about two things. This, this dinosaur in this picture is about to potentially consume two children. Its mouth is wide open, and it's producing something that sounds like a lion's roar. Well, let's take, take a look at the science behind dinosaur sound making. So of course they use the sounds of a lion, but lions are only distantly related to dinosaurs. If we look at our closest cousins to, live, to dinosaurs, let's listen to some of the sounds they make. All right, that's pretty different. What about this? Now, usually when I play that sound, if we were in a real audience, I would say, well, that sounds kind of like a lion. We can see that. But then I mentioned that that sound, like all other crocodilian sounds, is made with the mouth completely closed. And so this is not a sound that's produced like a lion with the mouth open, but one that is closed. And in fact, that we did a study of living dinosaurs, and we looked at the um, probability that this closed mouth sound making would be present in the ancestor um, of the, the common ancestor of crocodilians and birds, and then within that lineage. So it turns out that within living dinosaurs, birds, you see a whole variety of closed mouth vocal behaviors. And in fact, they're quite common in dinosaurs that are uh, birds that are, are most at the base of the tree of living species. And those species, um, essentially what's going on, if we listen to this very a kind of soft sound that we'll play here from, um, from an ostrich, is that the mouth is, is closed after the esophagus is inflated. So they're gonna breathe air in, they're gonna close the mouth, and then these sounds like you're gonna hear kind of faintly coming in um, booming sounds are going to uh, play. So that was very faint, surrounded by a lot of noisier dinosaurs, but what we're hearing is um, a low boom, um, and that is a, a male specific call that is produced in the context of mating. And what we found, in, in fact, you, I like to point out that you can actually see this closed mouth vocal behavior pretty much all around you with doves. So one of the common call types in doves is it, you can see the esophagus inflated and this cooing um, sound that is made in, in, in much obviously smaller species. So sometimes these have been referred to as air sacs, but in fact, this is the inflation of the esophagus in, in almost uh, all of these birds. So what we found was that there was about a 50% probability that this was ancestral to the common ancestor of crocodilians and birds. That's Archosauria, if you care about this complex plot that's on the right. And it was um, seen significantly associated with increases in body size within living birds. So most extinct dinosaurs are much larger than most living birds, and this behavior is uniquely associated with, um, or, or rather significantly associated with increases in body size. So this leads us to think that this was um, like in living crocodilians, like in a lot of species of early diverging or branching birds within extant, the extant radiation um, present in extinct dinosaurs. So this leads to 
a very different look for uh, extinct dinosaurs and a very different uh, set of sounds that they may have produced. So let's talk about how sound is produced. So we're going between the imagination and the science behind how we study and approach these things. So let's go back to the imagination and look at what movies have had to say about dinosaur sound making and take that apart. I give you the resonating chamber of a velociraptor. Listen to this. Wow. This is brilliant, Billy. Really, it is. It's sad to say, it's just a little bit late. So. In this video clip, what we saw was a putative velociraptor resonating chamber. And this is in one of the later Jurassic Park movies. And they're using that to produce a sound, which I hope you recognize is from uh, an extant crocodilian. So they're getting closer. It's not a lion's roar, but it's um, a crocodilian uh, a sound that, that is being used. But they talk about a resonating chamber. So let's break down how sound is produced and how sound is shaped. So in living crocodilians, and in fact, all tetrapods, including us, sound is produced by vocal folds located at the end of the airway, which is called um, the trachea, and they're produced in the larynx. And if you look at this little video here of what you're gonna see is a spinning sort of crocodilian head stake and you're gonna see the vocal folds appear in the center of that, and that's sitting right at the end of the airway. So let's take a look at this um, as it spins around. Now, those little tiny things, the muscles that are attaching to the vocal folds that produce sound in crocodilians are primarily in purple there. So if we look to birds, living dinosaurs, we see a, a very different um, setup. So essentially, they have a vocal organ that's located deep in the chest, has a new name, syrinx, and it's located where the airway branches to go to the lungs. And the syrinx has the same, has muscles and it has vocal folds, but it's located deep in the chest. And in fact, this is a structure that is behind all of the calls that you hear in your backyard. Um, every bird sound is produced from the syrinx. Now, this is not a resonating chamber. This is where sound is produced, not shaped or resonated. If we look across all tetrapods, it's fascinating that it's only within dinosaurs that a new way of producing sound in a syrinx has evolved. So all of the other animals that I'm showing you here, from a whale to a bat to a frog to me talking to you today, we're all modified, we all have modified larynxes or parts of our larynx that are producing sound that is shaped by um, our mouths in this case and shaped in the case of a closed mouth vocalization in the frog in the mouth as well. But it's only in dinosaurs that we see a new vocal organ. So this prompted this new question, which was how, when does the syrinx arrive? arise within dinosauria. Can we get at that from the fossil evidence? And what would that say about the evolution of dinosaur sound making? Could we figure out, it turned out, as I told you at the beginning of the talk, that fossils often prompt questions, new questions about living species. And in this case, it really prompted us to look at estimating the earliest morphology or shape and form of the syrinx in living birds, which had never been done. So what was known about dinosaur sound making? Well, even in the, the movies, you hear about resonating chambers, which is where they got that concept because of these structures that are preserved only in one group of dinosaurs that is not particularly closely related to birds. So in this distant dinosaurian cousin of birds, you have these structures within the skull that are hollow. They are connected to the nose holes. Um, and they are resonating 
features. They're going to shape the sound after it is produced, but they are not the vocal folds. So in this case, we, we don't have any evidence of whether this is a larynx or a searing space sound source, but this was like all that was known about dinosaur sound making, that they, in this one group, there were these resonating features. You can't have resonation until you have sound production. So that's what, what they got wrong in the little film clip. So I started thinking about this question and it intersected with work that I had been doing for many, many years, which was um, looking at basically dinosaurs before the, the origin of all of the species we have today and relatives of living species of birds. So on the, on the left, stay with me, on the left you've got several fossils, uh, four fossils of extinct species related to living species today, like moas and things related to parrots, and then this is a fossil ostrich. And over here on the right, I had looked at arguably thousands of fossils, and I had never seen these structures. These are the structures that look like little rings. And what they are is, is mineralized supports for the airway, for the trachea. We have supports like that. They're not very well mineralized in us and in many other species. So what we see is I noticed that these structures were preserved and pretty well mineralized because they were being fossilized within relatives of living bird species. But in these other dinosaurs, including the one at the top where you have those resonating uh, features, you don't, I never saw these structures, these little ring-like structures. But I was thinking about these questions when a unique fossil came my way. And it led to the description of the earliest known fossil syrinx. So I'm gonna tell that story now, kind of the story behind the science and where we've gotten to. So um, this is our field site in Antarctica. The first time, the first fossil I worked on from Antarctica was a relative of living ducks and geese. And it was from this, this area shown on the screen. Um, and I hadn't been to Antarctica yet. Now I've been twice and I was invited to work on a second fossil that actually became kind of the locus for a lot of work on the evolution of dinosaur sound making. So um, let's talk about that. So here's the fossil and it was sitting in my office for a little bit too long. Um, and I was invited to work on this by Argentine collaborators. It was collected by the Argentine Antarctic um, program in the same time as the first fossil I worked on, but there was a little tiny bone that I could not identify. And I was, you know, like I could have just ignored it. Is that a toe bone? But I had CT, a scan data of this fossil. And so I went inside rather my students went inside and then they got this image of the thing I couldn't identify. And it turned out I was, I, I really was excited because I was like, that looks like a syrinx. First of all, it looks like those tracheal rings that I see in living bird species, which I would expect because this is a relative of living bird species, but it looks like the actual support structure to the vocal folds. And in fact, that's what it was. It was three dimensionally preserved, tiny size, about the size of a pill that you would take. Um, within this fossil and we were able to digitally extract it and we had reassembled a couple of its parts. You can see most of it was three-dimensional but we were able to put it back together and we have this beautiful structure that supports the vocal folds in living dinosaurs, birds, in this fossil from 60, about 68 million years ago. But what do we do? Well, in fact, if you go to the literature on syrinxes, there are a lot of pictures of bird syrinxes. These are all different bird sound makers that are shown on the screen, but none of them had comparable evidence, like things that could be directly compared to the fossils, the fossil. So another thing that was an issue with looking at living animals was that we didn't have, um, I should say that these fossil, these syrinx anatomy data had been collected with the interest in figuring out the evolutionary tree of uh, birds. So they were used to kind of fill, uh, fill out this tree and inform kind of species relationships within this. So that's what people were interested in primarily in looking at the structure of the syrinx. Another thing that held us back in this work 
was that most of the work on sound making in living birds has been done on uh, model species. So this is the zebra finch. And it's been, in, there's incredible discoveries that have been made about song uh, production and vocal learning in this group of songbirds. But the things I was interested in were much more like this. And in chickens, if you look at any textbook descriptions of searing anatomy and function, they're all songbirds. So we had to get a handle on what the earliest syrinx would look like. How does that compare to the fossil? And for that, we needed to look uh, back to our friend, the chicken and its relatives. So we had to generate a whole new kind of data that had never been generated, which was looking at the 3D geometry of the support structures for the vocal folds. And it was really CT data that enabled us to compare those geometries and now in our current work to start relating them to sound production. But first we were just trying to make sense of what does a duck sound producer look like? What does a chicken, what does, how does this compare to the fossil? So this, these were key data that we brought to bear on the first description of what a syrinx anatomically is. So there hadn't been a description of what makes a syrinx. How do you distinguish it from any other juncture between the airway and the things that go to the lungs, the bronchi? So that was a major breakthrough, something that really excited me about this project. But what we found was that the evidence from the syrinx was consistent with the evidence from the rest of the bones in the animal, um, placing this within uh, ducks and chickens but specifically more closely related to ducks. And that had to do with a slight asymmetry in the organ that is pe peculiar to that group. So we have the earliest known fossil uh, sound maker, which is not a resonating chamber. That happens um, after the sound is produced. So in the trachea, in shaped by closed mouth vocal behaviors with, with um, in the case of uh, in, in esophageal inflation. So it's a whole new thing. And in fact, I tried to summarize what I just talked about in terms of what does the science say about dinosaur sound making? Well, based on um, our study, uh, we think it's likely that both closed and open mouth vocalization was present, especially in larger bodied dinosaurs. And I should say that within the living, living birds, it's common to produce both closed and open mouth vocalization. Whereas if you look at crocodilians, they're basically all closed mouth vocalization. So somewhere between the kind of crocodilian dinosaur ancestor and living day, we're gonna have a shift towards more open mouth vocalization. The earliest known um, fossil sound source is still this, the, uh, the syrinx is still in a part of the living bird radiation. So we still don't have the model T of sound makers, but we have kind of, I like to say the Chevy Impala of sound makers. So what we wanted to, we figured out what the model T, the earliest known syrinx, if you will, um, would have looked like, but we haven't yet found that in the fossil record. And the last part of this slide, you can ask me about in the Q&A, but it has to do with why would a new vocal organ uniquely arise within dinosaurs? Because in all other cases, obviously the larynx is an incredibly flexible structure. I'm using it to speak with you today. Um, why would it, a, a new structure uniquely evolve in um, dinosaurs? So, you know, when we think or approach this question, why I've been working on it for seven years is that Sound making is not just the province of the vocal organ. You have to think about the evolution of other aspects of the system that produces um, vocalizations or song. And that includes the brain, so neural control of, of sound making. And it includes the respiratory system, which is pretty unique in living birds. Well, we can gain insight into this whole system in the fossil record in different ways. And so what we're trying to do now is put that all together. Let's look at one, let's look at the brain for a moment. So what we see in our favorite or most charismatic dinosaurs like T-Rex is they have very small brains. They have not particularly bird-like brains, uh, if you will, to me, <laughs> I guess I should say. 
Um, but they still have a, an organization that's closer to crocodilians. If you look at small raptor dinosaurs, like the one in the top part of the screen, the green part is the forebrain. It's still pretty small compared to what you see in living birds. And in fact, we just published a, a new paper showing that a new fossil suggests that the Brain, the forebrain stays fairly small even well after the origin of flight. So that's kind of interesting, suggesting that if you just look at the right part of the screen, um, that there's this increase in forebrain size that might be really recent in dinosaur evolution, might characterize um, living dinosaurs, dinosaur survivors, that is birds. Um, but there's a whole bunch of earlier reorganizations that are also kind of intermediate steps. But when we talk about bird song today, it involves both hindbrain components, forebrain components that are in, involved in sound making. And we can definitively say things like T-Rex do not have bird brains. So no Polly wants a cracker from your T-Rex. In fact, vocal production learning, the ability to mimic is something that arises within living birds, within particular groups of living birds like parrots and songbirds, hummingbirds and others, but not going to be present in your uh, T-Rex. So let's conclude with a fun discussion going back to the video, when do dinosaurs make sounds? Well, often in videos or movies like this, you see dinosaurs are producing sound in response to humans, um, that is not members of their own species, and to, so often when they're about to consume children. So in fact, the most important context in which living dinosaurs produce sound and their close relatives, the crocodilians, is in rearing young, so things that are involved in the mating system and in the, um, in the, the young rearing system. So both crocodilians and uh, uh, living bird species, most of them, or ma er many of the early branching ones like ostriches, produce sound within the egg. And there's communication between the young and the adults uh, after the young hatch from the egg. And so the syrinx is starting in the case of birds and the larynx in the case of crocodilians is a viable sound producer when they are still uh, not yet hatched. But another important context is, again, um, things that are involved in sexual signaling. This might be in terms of display. It might be um, ma maintenance of a territory. But these are these key contexts related to what I, I described as sexual selection in which sound is made. And since most sound is produced on the exhale, it is generally a bad idea to make a very loud sound and then eat a small child. So you would have fully exhaled and then ingested, not a great idea. So you can think about that at your next uh, screening. So I like to say that if we remade Jurassic Park in a kind of more realistic way, not only would there be more closed mouth dinosaurs, not only would there be just diverse body coverings and shimmering iridescence and some of the closer relatives of living birds, but it would be a lot more like a rom-com. So you can imagine a very different Jurassic world. Um, so I hope I've taken you today from the vision of dinosaurs in the 19th century, these lugubrious um, spiny-backed guys that look more Tuatara-like, to a very different vision. And I hope with thinking about these aspects of dinosaur behavior that I've brought you to my vision of dinosaurs, which is a sense of wonder at all of these other intelligences, the the current standing of 66 million years of Earth his of dinosaur evolution after the extinction of non-bird dinosaurs, where we're surrounded by these highly vocal, uh, intelligent things that look nothing like us. And so I think that they put us in our place. I think dinosaurs help remind us that of our, um, that so long we thought we were uh, more unique than we are with respect to aspects of cognition. Studies of dinosaur or bird um, cognition 
are way behind, have been started way later than in mammals because of our interest in ourselves. So if we can all be more interested in the life around us that is not us, then we'll all be in a better place. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you and um, open up for questions.